Hi, everybody. Arsalan Arif here with Endpoints News. And thanks for joining us today for the AI drug discovery revolution, how NYC is prepared to lead. We're sponsored by New York City Economic Development Corporation. And I'm excited to moderate today's expert panel. Joining us today, we have Kyle Konecki, the Vice President of Life Sciences and Healthcare at NYC EDC. We also have Priyanka Shah, Associate Director of Life Sciences at Endless Frontier Labs. Mike Barron, a partner at Pfizer Ventures, also joining us. And lastly, Server Ertum, Chief Executive Officer at Sanavia Oncology. Today's webinar is a roundtable discussion with these experts, so we welcome you to join the conversation. I'm going to kick things off with a roundtable discussion, but please hit the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. As soon as you think of a question for the panel, we will get to your questions. This webinar will be available on demand tomorrow to rewatch or share it with your colleagues. And now I'm going to kick things off and let's get started with you, Kyle. So with NYC EDC, let's just kick it off and just ask you right off the bat, why is New York City an ideal city to locate an AI enabled biotech company, Kyle? Um, great question. Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure, by the way. Uh, so I feel like there are all the ingredients really necessary to have a thriving biotech plus AI ecosystem here in New York City. We have, for one, a massive uh, talent Um, oh, Kyle. As far as life science in the, the metro statistical area and um, over 350,000 in the tech industry. And so the talent pool is really incredible, but we also have a lot of IP generated from um, multiple different uh, institutions such as Columbia, NYU, Rockefeller, Memorial Sloan Kettering, Mount Sinai, all of these places are really leaders in um, both AI and uh, and health tech. Um, and of course, we are the global financial capital of the world. We have Wall Street here. We have multiple venture capital firms. We have over 400 that are actually have offices here and more are expanding every single day. So Sequoia just moved an office here, 816Z, Lightspeed Capital. Um, and we actually rank second globally in terms of startup valuation and ex exits. So all of these features really lend itself to New York City being a really great place to start a company or grow one here, all the way from the earliest stage to late stage companies. Wonderful, okay. Well, Mike, a partner at Pfizer Ventures, how about yourself? I mean, Pfizer's got obviously uh, based in New York City. Um, I'm guessing that you would also have a perspective on this question over here, why New York City would be a great place to have an AI focused biotech company. Yep, thanks for having me here, Arslan, and thanks for the question. Um, I am a New York native, so I certainly have a hopefully unbiased uh, perspective on this. And as you mentioned, Pfizer is a New York company. So um, I, brought, I actually brought some num numbers along with me for this one. And the numbers come from, ironically, uh, an NYC EDC report on uh, the state of New York life science, which was published last year. And there's really kind of there's three points to make, right? Like one is New York is just uh, a big place for business in general, let alone life science. And then two, uh, life science in general has a, a, a massive presence here that is actually, um, when I read the numbers, and I'll share some of it in a minute, it was somewhat surprising to me because I focus primarily in therapeutics development. Uh, the report takes a, a broader look at life science uh, in general, right, which captures way more than just therapeutics, right? Um, the hospital network, uh, diagnostics tools, technologies, things like that. I mean, it's a, when you look at life science as like a broad category, it's, it's, it's way bigger than um, just therapeutics. And when you do that, actually, New York it stands, head in, it stands out as, I think, number one across most categories in terms of number of biotech companies here, number of jobs. Um, again, being closer to the therapeutics, we, we often think of Boston and San Fran as uh, the leaders of the, when we think of bio hubs. And, and they are for therapeutics. But again, you know, New York is a, is a place as we look uh, more broadly. Uh, and then lastly, if you just flip to uh, tech, right? So you have all the components that Kyle mentioned, right, on, on the science side. On the tech side, most of big tech is here. I mean, if uh, Silicon Valley, uh, the Bay Area is kind of the brain, you can make the argument that the art is here. Or we flip that vice versa. But, you know, like Google has an office here, IBM, Twitter, like everyone has an office here. Now, I think the thing that we're starting to see is a handful of um, 
uh, what we would call tech bio, which is kind of like uh, the fusion of AI and machine learning and, and biotech and therapeutic development coming together in New York. And um, like Kyle mentioned, there's a, a bunch of larger established venture funds. I would mention uh, two others that uh, focus specifically on this tech bio space. One that's been around for a while, Lux Capital, most of us are familiar with. Uh, but also more recently, some of the Lux team spun out a, uh, a fund called Dimension. This is like a few months ago, right? A $350 million fund to focus uh, specifically on this, this space. And uh, a handful of those companies are already in New York, right? So on the clinical side, we have um, uh, Tempest and uh, AI Cure. Tempest, I think, is Midtown, AI Cure in the village. And then on the therapeutic side, Roy Van, obviously like a, a Pfizer uh, friend, right? We work together on across a number of different avenues. And um, and then over here in Alexandria, close to where I live, uh, Calio, which uh, focuses on gut-brain interface. So those are like uh, the, the well, Roy, Roy Van's pretty big, but these are like the, the first crops to be growing. And we have all the ingredients here and we have capital and, and talent. And I think um, this is the place to be and we could really carve a niche out here uh, for tech bio in, in New York City. Capital, talent, tech bio, New York City, all of that, all that you came with the goods right there, Mike, that seems very exciting. Uh, Server, I also wanted to pose this question to you. So I understand you're in New York. Um, tell us why you think New York is a good place for these type of companies to be at Server. Sure. Thanks, Arsalan, for the invitation. Great to be a part of this panel. I came to New York uh, 20 years ago to do my PhD at Wild Cornell Medicine, and I followed that with a postdoctorate at Memorial Sloan Kettering. So I can speak to my experience about an entrepreneur building a biotech company in New York and how City helped us build Sanavia Oncology over the last two years. Uh, when I finished my postdoctorate at Sloan Kettering, I also wanted to explore uh, the intersection between tech and bio, and the city has been positioning uh, herself at the intersection of tech and bio, and I did an entrepreneurship, uh, I was a part of an entrepreneurship program at Cornell Tech on Roosevelt Island, and so that allowed, allowed me to bridge the gap between the basic biology that I have and how we can use tech and machine learning and AI to automate and scale what we learn in the biology space, and when we started uh, started off uh, Sanavia, uh, the city actually supported us in many ways. The first of it as an entrepreneur is actually to find a place to, to set up your lab. So over the last couple of years, there have been so many incubators, fully equipped incubators that you can start from day one and actually build the proof of concept data. So we were, uh, uh, we were homed at uh, BioLabs at NYU, but there are other places like JLabs, Alexandria's Launch Labs, and also the pharma uh, community supported us. We got, a, we got the first golden ticket from Bristol Myers that gave us a place to stay and work for a year for rent free and use all the equipments. Um, the New York City Life Sciences team also supported us. I don't wanna embarrass you, Kyle, but you guys have been very supportive in this uh, to go to the venture capital uh, investment conferences and meet investors. And actually where we met one of our investors, our main investor, that we closed three rounds of investment so far over the last two years. So uh, Two Bear Capital is our main investor. Uh, that's also a firm uh, that's based in Silicon Valley. They invest in the intersection of tech and bio. And at the moment, they're also considering opening an office in the city. So we're able to show them uh, there's, there's, a, there's a potential in the city. And uh, when it comes to the talent, our goal has been to build an academic biotech. So for an early stage biotech company, the biggest risk is the biological risk. So we wanted to bet on young, hungry scientists, rising stars in academia to come and join our team. And over the last 18 months, we actually recruited over 25 people from Sloan Kettering uh, Memorial, Sloan Kettering, Wild Cornell Medicine, Rockefeller, and, and Columbia University. So uh, there's a new crop of scientists that understand the biology as well as the tech and computational and the statistics aspect of it. And our new director of artificial intelligence and machine learning is joining uh, us from Palo Alto. So he's moving to New York. So we see talent actually uh, coming back to New York uh, who wants to play at the intersection of tech and bio. Very interesting. Well, that's quite an endorsement over there of how much you've been helped um, from NYC EDC 
and your own personal journey of starting that thing and the support that you've gotten on your entrepreneurial journey there. That's um, that's quite something. Uh, Priyanka, I want to get you also in this discussion over here and pose a question to you. Uh, but before I do that, I want to ask the audience to please get your questions in. We have a, a very nice audience here today. Thank you for everyone for taking time to meet with us today. Go ahead and get your questions in and I'll make sure to pose all of them to our panel over here. Uh, but Priyanka, a question that I have for you um, first um, let's talk about intellectual property rights uh, and AI. This is a pretty hot button topic over here. So what I want to ask you is how can intellectual property rights be managed and protected when AI contributes to the discovery process of that drug, Priyanka? Yeah, thanks for the question. And thanks again for having me. Um, great to be here on this exciting topic. So, you know, I really feel like the introduction of AI into the drug discovery process has opened the door and the floodgate for perspectives on the law's ability to govern the new scenarios that it presents. And so to share a little history recognizing this, um, the US Patent and Trademark Office actually issued a formal request for the public to comment on patenting AI-assisted inventions in August of 2019. They got a ton of feedback and the feedback really highlighted the need to reaffirm if current laws and regulations involving inventorship need to be revised um, to consider contributions from entities that aren't natural persons or human beings, you know, something that's so futuristic but happening today before our eyes. And so in response, the government issued a report indicating that AI couldn't invent or conceive invention without human intervention and that current inventorship law is really equipped to handle inventorship that involves AI technology. So they thought everyone was fine, everything was fine. But that being said, there are still critics who continue to highlight situations as our understanding of AI and our ability to apply it evolves, where AI systems actually output patentable in inventions or contribute at a level of a joint inventor. And so I wanted to highlight a really famous case. Um, it's a 2020 ruling on Thaler versus Vidal. Some in the audience may have heard about this, but um, this was really a, a critical case where um, I guess a request to really grant inventor status to an AI system that reportedly conceived two inventions in the neuromodulation space um, was denied. And so in the wake of that decision um, and just understanding how AI is evolving, there's still uncertainty on AI inventorship and if the current state of law provides patent protection for innovation and invention and um, inventions in that space, in, in this space in particular. So it's interesting where things are going. I think very recently, um, the Biotechnology Innovation Organization put out a statement that they feel AI is a tool not deemed to possess the agency purpose, motivation, or capacity for ideation. And they really feel that significant human involvement is required in making AI assistant inventions. So it'll be interesting to see how law is interpreted, how it's expanded to make sure that rights are protected across the human and non-human line. Um, but wanted to share some of that history and, and perspective for consideration. Oh, wonderful. Um, well, while we have you, Priyanka, um, can you tell us a little bit about Endless Frontier Labs and what Endless Frontier does? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So Endless Frontiers is a science and technology based um, startup accelerator for early stage technologies that are really transforming scientific breakthroughs. This is science that we're really at the frontiers of science. Um, and translating all of that into societal impact. And so in my role, I lead our life sciences track. Um, really cool to see some of the hottest innovations that we source around the world um, come to, to our accelerator program that's based in New York City. And many of our life sciences startups, for example, Immune AI is one of our recent unicorn graduates, um, are actually applying AI in drug discovery, where Immune AI in particular um, is uncovering groundbreaking immunotherapeutic targets. So a little bit about Endless, happy to share more if, if anyone would like to, to reach out after this panel. Wonderful. Um, thank you, Priyanka, over there. Um, Kyle, I, I want to ask you a question. Actually, I want to actually just yank a question right from the audience right now and just interject it into this while we have you, um, because we had such a wonderful endorsement from server or, or earlier. I'm going to ask the question from the audience right now. I would like to ask Dr. Konecki if he can share information 
on any specific incentive programs that New York City may have available to encourage or assist companies looking to grow? I'm wondering if you just address that really quickly here, Kyle. Sure, it's a great question and something that I was hoping somebody would actually ask. So thank you for the question. Um, there are a lot of different programs actually that are available here in both New York City and state. And one thing that I will say is watching the partnership between Governor Hochul and um, Mayor Adams has just been really inspiring and remarkable. Uh, both of these individuals and leaders have shown that life sciences and tech are both priority industries. And so they're doubling down and really investing heavily in uh, these industries. And so from the city side, we actually here at EDC, we manage the $1 billion LifeSci NYC fund, uh, which mainly goes to building out infrastructure because I mentioned earlier, you know, there are there are multiple things that a biotech company needs from IP, talent, uh, money. But the fourth thing that they really need is space. And that was for the longest time, the thing that we really didn't have. And so a lot of the money is actually used to fit out space, whether it is TI and landlord work, um, or actually developing entire buildings from the ground up. Uh, we can either offer, you know, city capital to nonprofits or industrial development agency uh, tax uh, tax benefits to for-profit agencies or companies that are looking to actually build their space. Um, we also have what's called the expansion fund. So if companies are looking to move, grow here, uh, we can offer pretty significant amounts of money to them. And there's also smaller things that we do in partnership with other um, organizations. So for instance, the XSEED Award, which is in partnership with Deerfield Management and uh, awards uh, annually money to women-led uh, biotech companies. Uh, from the state side, there are a lot more, there's a lot more incentives that are geared towards like the, the biotech companies themselves. So I am incredibly excited actually to say that uh, in the most recent legislative session, they passed two different incentive packages, including an SBIR matching program. So any company that gets an SBIR, they can apply for that to actually get a matching amount from the state. They, we also have a biotech tax credit uh, where you can write up, up, off, up to $500,000 a year for R&D expenditures. Uh, there's the state small business credit incentive program uh, that would be matching for pre-seed and seed. Uh, so if you're getting money from venture capital already, there's a chance that it could actually be matched from the state. And then there's programs like Startup New York, where they're actually giving money back to the employees themselves. So I, I was a participant in this Startup New York in the company that I um, you know, worked for before coming to EDC, and I didn't have to pay any state income taxes uh, because we were part of that program. And then lastly, we also have the Excelsior Jobs uh, Program tax cuts. And so an example of a use of this was um, Governor Hochul actually just announced $7.6 million expansion uh, incentives for Schrodinger headquarters to actually expand, um, as well as actually a biodefense uh, commercialization fund, $40 million in that. So there's a lot of different programs here in New York City and state, and we're working together to grow these industries. And it's just a perfect time to expand the business here. Wonderful. Um, we're getting several questions in from the audience, some great ones on terms of company formation and what do I do to get started. And I'm gonna I'm gonna shell those for right now. I'm gonna get right back to you. I'm gonna pose those to you, Kyle. Uh, but real quick, while I still have you, um, what is essentially the the mission um, of NYC EDC? What are you there to do? If someone's gonna look to start a, a biotech company in your area, do they call you first? What what's your mission? That's a great question. Uh, so. EDC is a quasi-governmental agency. We report to the deputy mayor, um, and we are the city's primary vehicle for promoting economic growth across all the, the five boroughs. And so our mission is really to stimulate growth through expansion and redevelopment programs uh, that would encourage investment, uh, generate jobs and prosperity in a very equitable way, um, and strengthen the city's competitive pos position, uh, especially in high growth industries. So we focus in certain industries such as green economy, offshore wind, and of course, life sciences and tech, which is why we are here today. Wonderful. Um, just one very quick follow-up question. We have one question from the audience that says, I'd like to ask Kyle where we can find the details of all of those great incentives for biotech. So if you have a quick thing, you could tell the audience, but likely we'll be able to follow up with all the registrants and send them something as well, something direct, but Kyle. 
Sure. So two resources that I would recommend right, right away is lifesci.nyc is our website that we administer. So that's those are the city incentives. There's more than that beyond uh, that come from the city, especially from the small business service, SBS. But then the other one is Empire State Development. So those are the two websites I would recommend going to. You can also sign up for our newsletter. Um, it only comes once a quarter. And those are great ways to hear about new programs. Great. Wonderful, Kyle. Uh, I'll come back to you and we'll get to some more company formation and some other stuff here in a little bit. But Mike, I wanted to turn the discussion a little bit back uh, to AI models um, and and in terms of, 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 of using high quality, diverse and comprehensive data to train these models effectively, Kyle. Um, uh, Mike, so in terms of making them interpretable, understandable in these complex decision-making processes, uh, I want to ask you, do you feel that the black box proprietary nature of many of these machine learning algorithms might impede knowledge sharing? And, and you must see a bunch of companies come through as an investor over there. Does it help or prevent you from making informed decisions about their capabilities? Yep. Thanks for the question. I see uh, Rich here in the chat uh, had a question and you skillfully weave that into your uh, your setup question here. So we'll try to kill two birds with one stone. Um, I'll give you a, 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 a soundbite, actually, to start my answer here. So um, trust comes from the familiar, but value comes from the unexpected, right? And so let me explain that. When When and I've been firsthand, you know, I've, at Pfizer, I've been evaluating some of these AI options and how we can uh, apply them to drug discovery. Now, the first thing we're going to look at, regardless of what the approach is for, is that the AI tool is going to give you some sort of output. And you're going to look at that output and you're going to say, does that make sense to me or, you know, a body of experts that I can assemble? Um, and you're looking for something that looks familiar, right? That's where trust comes from the familiar. You have to trust the AI in order for the second part, which is the value comes from the unexpected. So you don't need the AI to tell you something you already know. You need it to suggest things that are new that you would have missed that are unexpected. But it's kind of like there's a tension there, right? Because you can't trust in, and, and go forward with some of these suggestions that come out of the tool unless you actually trust what it's outputting. So you have to have a few examples in there that um, you know make sense to you. Now the black box part is where it gets challenging, right? Because as you evaluate these tools, uh, you want to understand why, why the algorithm is making uh, certain uh, recommendations, decisions, why, why the outputs are there. And um, so I, about seven or eight years ago, we worked with IBM Watson. That's a long time ago, right? Seven, eight years in tech terms is probably like 20, 30 years in you know, human time. Um, <laughs> but um, back then, this is the exact problem we hit up against. So what we were trying to do was we were trying to use Watson to predict if a clinical trial would be successful on a given molecular target. And the algorithm performed great if the biology was known and we were just taking you know, a known drug target that had already been in humans for one disease and trying it in a second. No problem, right? There's a rich data uh, to uh, train an algorithm on there. But it failed when it came to novel biology. You have a novel drug target. How do you train an algorithm if we don't even understand kind of how things are working or have a data set around that? Um, and so that's where that one kind of stumbled, right? And, and we didn't have the ability to drill down and understand why the algorithm was making certain uh, recommendations. It was a black box. Now, fast forward to today, I'm not involved with the project, but we work with an Israeli company called um, Cytovia. And... Um, from my understanding, this one is going uh, very well. I think we are, oh, sorry, not Cytovia, Cyto Reason, Cyto Reason, apologies, um, but an Israeli company. And uh, I believe they've selected a target and we're on the verge of uh, going into the clinic, into humans with an AI you know, influenced uh, discovery target uh, in IBD. Uh, another example that's probably more mature <clears throat> is a company, public company called Accentia, traded on the NASDAQ. Um, and they have big collaborations with BMS and Sanofi. They're in the clinic already, right? And so that's that'll be a nice proof point to see how that plays out, go forward. Um, again, not a New York company, but uh, since they're on the NASDAQ, they had to come through here. Uh, so uh, we can we can link it back to New York in some way. But um, yeah, so the so the black box question uh, must be able to uh, we must be able to get past that these days as we start seeing some of these kind of AI selected um, drug targets progressing into human studies. Wonderful. All right. Yeah. 
Great, great answer. Anyone else have anything to add to that? Arsalan, I can follow up on that. Uh, Mike was mentioning uh, novel biology in the in the field of oncology. Uh, as you know, there are tremendous advances over the last decade, including the immunotherapies, but there's still a big gap in how to treat uh, 75, even 80% of the patients with the current treatment. So there's the problem of drug resistance uh, in most of these patients and understanding that biology is key uh, to developing therapies that can overcome that, uh, that overcome that resistance. So uh, when I think of AI, I think of prediction, I think of efficiency, I think of automation, but AI's predictive uh, capability is limited by the data that you're feeding uh, to, the, to the AI machine. It could be the quality of the data, it could be the clinical relevance of the data, and eventually the size of the data. And I, that's where um, Sanavia is uh, hopefully playing a role in, in tapping into a novel biology that governs that drug resistance uh, so that we can understand that biology, uh, we can capture that data at a, at a high throughput way, at a scalable way, and then capture it in a machine learning ready way, which I think is also important in a structured annotated format so the, the machine learning can be applied readily. Um, Biology is a data science. So most of the biology, because of the sequencing advances we've been looking at was at the DNA level and at the RNA level, you can generate a lot of data there. Uh, and then there's the protein level. But what we're seeing and others have shown is maybe some of that drug resistance biology, the biology that's gonna actually improve patients' lives, that data may not be stored solely at the DNA and the RNA level. What we're saying is it's not even stored at the protein level, we're seeing that there's a post-translational modification of the proteins, the way protein structure changes. And that's a new code that we don't know the grammar yet. We don't know the semantics of that language, but we see that's where the, the data is stored. And uh, we need data platforms that can actually tap into that biology in a scalable format so that we can feed that into the AI models. Okay. Well, let me ask you an extension of that server, because I wanted to ask you how AI models can actually integrate with experimental validation in the drug discovery process. Anything you could give us on, on that? Um, well, we've seen computational, tons of computational power thrown at the biology to understand the complexity of biology, and biology always beats computers in that sense. So I think our sense is to understand the biology first, uh, and then use those tools to automate and scale that data using AIs. So that's the approach that we're taking. Uh, we, because of our platform technology, we're able to identify these unexplored epitopes in known targets everybody has been working on for 20, 30 years, or even new targets as of a new function in drug resistance. We then use uh, high throughput antibody development technology to find antibodies against those targets. But then that's where the AI comes into play, that you need to find the right targets. We are obsessed about finding cleanest targets. You need to pair the right target with the right therapeutic modality. It could be a CAR T, ABC by specific. And that's a complex question that the humans maybe can solve if they worked on it for 200 years, but I think AI can help, help us. But like Mike was saying, do you trust the data coming out of the AI? Uh, we don't, we always go back to the lab and validate it. Uh, but the more you do this cycle, uh, it comes those um, discrepancies between the AI and uh, the empirical data. Actually, those gaps get smaller and smaller. So you build you more confidence on the data you're getting out of the AI. Wonderful. Well, I'm, I'm, I wrote that down. Trust comes from, from the familiar and value comes from the unexpected. I'm going to be using that line a couple of times, Mike. Um, so thank you um, very much for that. Um, I wanted to get to uh, a, a couple of questions here from the audience over here. Maybe Kyle, this is for you, but really I want to open this up to the panel, all of you from New York City over here. The question from the audience is, lots of incubator lab space has come online in the past five years. Is there still pent up demand to continue building out new lab spaces for other biotech incubators? Or secondly, what kind of programs are missing and need to be fulfilled? Question from the audience. Sure, that's a great question. Um, and so what I will say historically, you know, the biotech ecosystem here, again, it really wasn't existent up until fairly recently. And so there was really just a single incubator, maybe two incubators um, as, as 
lately as um, you know 2010. And now we actually have 10 incubators um, online across the city with two more coming on online very quickly. Um, and I do, see, yeah, we do see, in, in fact, more demand for space. S some of these incubators are completely full at capacity. They don't even, they don't like to be full because they need to allow for room for growth. And so there is a need for more incubators, but also it's kind of a factor or like a, you know, a factor of how the city is actually set up where many of the, the startups that are spinning out of the universities, they want to be as close as possible to the research labs where they are, you know, coming from so that the PIs, the postdocs, the graduate students can actually just, you know, maybe take an elevator or walk, you know, across the street um, to be able to work on both the academic research as well as the commercial side, keeping them pretty close. Now, we've focused a lot of our time and effort in building out those incubators. We're not completely done with it, but I, I think that we've made incredible progress over just the last five years. Now, what we're starting to see is those companies that went into those incubator labs are becoming really successful, and they're looking for new spaces, a lot larger spaces. You know, if they were taking up a, a thousand square feet at an incubator, now they're looking for maybe like five, eight, 20, 30,000 square feet. And so I think that this is where strategies are starting to shift to now. And we're also starting to see that, you know, the developer community is picking up on this. And so, you know, we're starting to see some of these more commercial lab spaces coming online from places like, like InnoLabs, um, The Cure by Deerfield in Kipps Bay, um, and other places across the city. And so there are these clusters that are forming naturally and um, from the market, but also, you know, with help from uh, both city and state governments. And so I see the continued need for this as this industry continues to develop, because it really is, we're, we're still in its in somewhat of an infancy, but we're seeing this rapid growth and we want to foster that as much as possible. Wonderful. Anyone else want to add to that? Yeah, I can tack on. Um, totally agree with Kyle and see the same theme in our accelerator lab. Our life science company is very hungry for lab space. We're always looking for partners, preferably within New York, but every now and then reaching out into New Jersey just to help everyone get set up. And I think the last perspective I'll share in terms of programs is that if you were to think about the life sciences ecosystem in Boston and also out in Cali, very well connected. And here in New York City, I think those connection points are building. And and continuing to build out just so that we get to that level. And so I would say secondary to programs, more just making sure that um, we have a well-oiled machine between academia, the VC space, um, big pharma, and accelerators such as ours is, is one thing that at Endless Frontiers we're really pushing to achieve. Wonderful. Um, I'm Mike, do you have something to add there? Yeah, I mean, I could just hop in real quick uh, just to be a little more somber. <laughs> Um, I, so I think, you know, in the earlier, like, um, uh, space where you, you would spin out like a, a new co, like a incubator, definitely like they all seem to be at capacity and, um, that's a problem. We need more space there. But, um, I think we have to acknowledge that in like the later stage space, like series A, B, C, and, and even beyond that, which is more where we focus with Pfizer Ventures, um, it's definitely a, a softening market and, um, you know, we don't need to, this isn't the topic of this panel, but there's definitely like uh, it's a tough situation now in the uh, in the public markets, and it just flows back into the private markets in terms of financing uh, biotech. And um, you know we see it firsthand on the ground. A year ago, it used to be if we wanted to move lab space, um, you know there'd be like two options, and one was very expensive, and the second one had like a year wait on the building to be built. Uh, now, with uh, a, a number of companies unfortunately shutting down, there's opportunities to sublease, and um, just it seems like there's more uh, negotiating power on the buyer side versus the, the landlord side in terms of uh, benefits and months of free rent and things like that. These are all kind of like biomarkers for the state of the real estate market. So I don't know if that's consistent also with the New York, uh, what's on the ground here, but that's how I see it. Yeah, and I would add just that that's not unique to New York. This is, you know, a global kind of slowdown. I think that yeah. everybody really had a banner year in 2021, um, especially with the uh, reaction to COVID. And now with the economy slowing down and fears of recession, you know, there's been this broader pullback. It's not just unique to New York City, though. Yeah. 
as a real life example, I can say we stepped out from a, an incubator and we moved into uh, Alexandria Center for Life Sciences uh, to a larger space. And we've been expanding to uh, Long Island City to have our own private vivarium. So the real estate developers, I can say, is very willing to work with you with your three, five year uh, development plans. And they're very flexible. They understand the, uh, the nature of the biotech business. Very cool. And congrats to that build out server. Um, very nice to hear. Um, I have a question. Over, we have um, a question from the audience over here um, about strategics versus VCs. So I guess, Mike, I'm going to pose this one to you. But of course, anyone here in the panel can go over. Um, the question is, um, the, 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 the person who's posed this question says that they have uh, found a new, a large language model platform that brings predictivity and quantifiable risk to drug development. Uh, they say that they have been fortunate and they have had no problem attracting investment interest from VCs, uh, but they would like to the panel's uh, knowledge on what's the value of raising capital from strategics versus VCs in this space. Mike, I don't think you're biased at all, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, representing a strategic. Well, th thanks for the question. Uh, we get this this one often. Um, you know, the the, uh, the one of the benefits of working with strategic investor is a you're forming a relationship uh, with a potential buyer down the road, which is always good. But also, you can tap into the expertise of when we say strategic. Often, we're talking about in this case, like uh, a pharma company's venture capital arm. Uh, you're tapping tapping into the full. Uh, capabilities of the, the research engine, which is, you know, tens of thousands of employees uh, that that company can, can tap into, not only to help with diligence for making the investment, but once the company is up and going, uh, getting advice, pre-consulting advice, things of that nature. Um, so I'll just also note that some people have this perception that uh, strategics often are looking for rights or something like that uh, when they invest in, in a biotech company, uh, at least with Pfizer Ventures, that's uh, not the case for the most part. Uh, we always uh, we we invest alongside the institutional investors, and um, just like anyone else, it's uh, we're just looking for the relationship. It's another way to have a touch point with uh, biotech companies before uh, we can have a formal business development discussion, which often is you know more data is needed, and that's why we invest. Gotcha. Server, do you have any insights on this one? Um, yeah, absolutely. I think both VC firms and the strategics have their uh, role in making a company successful. Uh, if you find the right partner early on as a VC firm that shares the, your vision, I think they can accelerate the process and give you the flexibility that you'll need. Uh, but at some point, you'll need validation, external validation, and that's where a strategic partnership can actually be, be very useful. Um, and some of the strategic funds uh, or investments can come, as Mike said, with access to the R&D arms of those pharma companies. So you actually uh, get the the professional help from the pharma companies as well. Um, it's uh, for, a, for a biotech company, it, I think it's always good to explore both options. I don't think it's mutually exclusive. And with the strategics, you also have multiple opportunities to work with different pharma companies. So uh, we're exploring all those options. Uh, but like I said, it's important to choose the right uh, investor partner early on. Great. Um, I want to ask a couple questions here from the audience that all have to do with getting started um, with something and uh, potentially here in New York City. Um, so the first one I want to pull from the audience says this, I'm going to read it verbatim. Thank you for this wonderful seminar. My question is broad. I am currently an NYU resident physician with some experience in manual drug discovery in conjunction with a small wet lab. I also have some experience in coding and plan on taking some machine learning courses at NYU. How can someone in my position obtain a role in AI in drug discovery, especially being in the Big Apple? So this is a little earlier than, than an entrepreneur over here, but definitely in the pipeline of folks who are eventually maybe going to start a company and whatnot. So I wanted to ask this question first to you, Kyle. Sure. Um, so you're asking me the question. It's a great question. Um, and I actually come from tech transfer. Um, I, you know, I did my PhD at Columbia University. And during that time, I spent many years, um, both during and after, uh, in Oren Hershkowitz's office at Columbia Technology Ventures. And they are incredible partners. And so if this person is at NYU, Mark Saddam, um, at the tech transfer office in at NYU, I think would be a fantastic partner 
to be able to at least, you know, if you have an idea that you would like to patent, um, they would be one of the great way, one of the a great first step to learn how to actually do that. If you don't know exactly what direction you're heading, they can still offer advice. Um, so that's that's probably the the way that I would really recommend uh, going at least. Anyone um, want to add anything to that server? Yeah, well, one of the programs that helped me um, a lot was uh, participating in the National Science Foundation's i program. I know New York has its own uh, regional uh, program. That program, uh, if you are, if you have an idea and if you know you're onto something, you just don't know how to build it, or if you don't know if there's a market for it, what the what your customer, who your customer is, what your customers' needs are, that's a, uh, that's a very helpful program to go through, which helps you, gives you um, uh, financial support to go and interview uh, stakeholders in the field. And that really focuses you uh, and look at your discovery in an objective way to see um, if, if there's going to be a market or not. And um, obviously programs like Endless Frontiers or the Runway Startup Program at Cornell Tech, uh, there, there are several programs in the city that helps the transition from academia to industry uh, more smoother. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to ask another question along this vein over here. The question reads, we just had a molecular target granted by the U.S. Patent Office for an oncology application. We believe it is a good candidate for AI-assisted drug discovery. Any advice on how to get it started? Thanks. I guess, Kyle, let me kick it to you first and then the rest of the panel. Um, so, I mean, if you have a patent, it, that's a great first step. You know, you've protected your, your innovation. Um, the next step really is going to be determining whether or not it is venture capital ready is what I would say. And so right now we are in a, a little bit of a, a strange economic time. And so um, Mike, I hope that I'm not stepping on any toes here or, or misspeaking at all, uh, but venture capital firms, it seems like they're, they're looking for a little bit more de-risking. And so uh, once you have that patent, you might need to go a little bit further within the development pathway. You know, if you have small, small animal data, that's great. Some people are asking for large animal or even, you know, getting into phase one clinical trials before they're willing to actually invest in it. Um, but you know, finding money, I think, to be able to carry out some of these these proof of concept and de-risking experiments is going to be the next step. Um, and if you're if you feel like you're ready to start a company, then of course it's going to be looking for the talent, uh, which can be a huge hurdle for a new company. Finding the right the right people to surround yourself with, um, yeah. Yeah, it, I would say, um, you know, if you have a, a target, right, the way I understood the question was there's an interesting, there's some interesting biology here, we need to move into, uh, they want to drug that target. And the middle step there is applying AI to maybe go a little faster, maybe, um, okay. you know, using it for chemistry or for uh, antibody design. So I, I mean, I, I think there's two, two ways to go about exploring that one is uh, make a list of of all the companies that are doing uh, AI based, you know, uh, chemistry or antibody design, and approach them, right? See if they want to work with you. Right? It, at, at worst, right? You just get a read on like uh, how they see the the target and the opportunity. Um, and then the second way would would be to uh, go through the um, the academic route, like look for investigators that are publishing on you know computational approaches to validate drug targets or design. Uh, you know, small molecules or large molecules, and uh, just try to have some conversations and, and get a read on almost like what Kyle was saying. You're trying to get at like, is this fundable? And once you have a better read on that, then you can apply for grants or you can maybe even one of those discussions turns into a partnership of some part of some type with uh, financial support. Yeah, and I will then add on to that. I think um, if you are if you had, have just the target and you're looking for you know the the molecule, of course you can look for libraries. I know for for instance, like the Broad uh, up in Boston actually has these you know plates full of libraries of compounds that could potentially you know be used to screen for the um, the actual therapeutic molecule of interest that could be a drug like the drug that target. Great. 
Wonderful. I want to ask a couple of questions back about AI and biopharma. We have several over here and lots of interest from the audience for the panel's uh, insights into this. So uh, Mike, I'm going to pose this to you, but then please, I want to open it up to the rest of the panel um, for your thoughts on this. But Mike, let me pose this to you. What are the first things that you look at when evaluating an AI for ability to support biopharma discovery? And what are examples of red flags? Yeah. Okay. So um, I guess, you know, a AI, when we th the way we think about AI at Pfizer is um, really we try to map it to the drug development uh, development pathway, right? Like, so it's so research, development, and then what we call patient experience, which is once you're beyond, you know, having a product, right? Each one of those is its own animal with its own criteria and with different goals, right? That your, your AI tool might be using. The other interesting thing is, you know, we've been talking a lot today about like, how do you validate these, some of these AI approaches, um, like the black box problem. It seems like the less mature, so the earlier you move up that uh, development landscape I just outlined, the harder it is to validate the, the AI output just because there's so many more unknowns, right? Um, so the easiest place to do it is really, you know, once you have an approved product and there's a lot of stuff happening in that space at the moment, and I, I would um, bring one thing that's Pfizer specific, that's an interesting uh, case study. So up in Cambridge, Mass, sorry, not, not New York, uh, we, have a, um, we have something called the Fire Labs, not spelled with an F, of course, but spelled with a, a PF, like for Pfizer. Um, and what they do there is they're working on uh, wearables, ultimately, to kind of drive towards like digital biomarkers. And um, we published a paper last year in uh, Nature Digital, was it Nature Digital? Um, digital medicine um, around an algorithm that we developed, I think with some people from BU uh, researchers, but uh, taking making use of the, uh, um, the movement tracking capabilities, right, on Fitbits or, or other Apple Watches, and being able to detect uh, not only sleep, I mean, that's pretty much built into like Fitbit at this point in time, but also um, other movement that can map to clinical endpoints, and specifically in this case, itch itch when you're sleeping, right? And so we work in uh, atopic dermatitis is one area we work in, which is uh, a disease that you know comes with rash and itch is a, a big thing that patients struggle with. So it's pretty straightforward, right? Now, if, you have, if you've developed an algorithm that's linked to a device and you're getting data output that can say, this person is likely sleeping and this person is likely itching and you can grade the severity of how much they're itching, that's pretty straightforward, right? Rather than trying to say like, does this biology work or not? Um, and so, you know, that that's just that's just one example on one far end of the spectrum. I talked earlier about on the opposite end with Watson with some of the struggles that we have. So I think it, it just comes down to like being able to like pass that first flag. What was it? Uh, trust comes from familiarity, right? So like, is the initial read that we're getting out of this tool something that makes sense to us? And if there's no way to kind of put that together, you don't pass the first hurdle, and then you can't move on to bigger and better things where you're actually using the AI to, to help you uncover the, the unexpected. Great. Any other comments from the panel on that? I can, I can add to that. Um, when I see an AI solution, I would ask, what's the clinical problem they're, they're trying to solve? Uh, which data set they use to train their model, but more importantly, how they validated the output coming from the AI? And there, there are a lot of roles for the AI for the clinical development. Obviously, it's a it's a long and expensive process. So, are there ways that we can use AI to improve the probability of success when we bring our drugs to the clinical trials? And which data sets we need for that? Um, so, collecting that data, um, you know, patient clinical trials might be anything from ten to three hundred patients. That may not be enough for an AI model to be trained. So, we need the the field needs. Um, more predictive in vivo, in vitro, and even in silico tools that can generate that data set at, at scale. Um, and then I think AI can play a role in looking at imaging data, biomarkers, um, next-gen sequencing data, combine it all together, but then reduce that complexity eventually. So when we go to an oncologist, for example, in the case of cancer, we don't give them a 70-page report with multiple mutations with no actionable information, but actually we can give them a, a detailed, refined, yes and no uh, answer, actionable information. 
So AI's role I see is to digest all that complexity and give the, the practitioners uh, actionable information. And for that, we need uh, platforms that can give us high throughput uh, quality data. Kyle, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, I mean, what I could actually just say is that, so building off of what Server just said, you know, there's a lot of wonderful new initiatives that are going on here in the city that are actually looking to generate some of that data very specifically for training AI models. I think um, if you look at training of AI models outside of biology, um, I'm thinking of like chat GPT, you know, they have massive sets of data. And it, if you, you know, comparatively, biotech actually has relatively few. I mean, we're getting much better at it. Of course, we have whole genome sequencing and everything. And even like something as far as, you know, far as like GWAS, where you're looking at linkage dis disequilibrium uh, to find hits, you know, the ML or AI methods can vary really greatly in their complexity. Uh, all the way from, you know, simple logistic regression to, you know, building more random force or even gradient boosting methods. But the amount of data that you need for these kinds of models is, is pretty large. And so some of the, the initiatives here in the city, so Mount Sinai actually just launched a large scale genetic sequencing project with, with the Regeneron Genetic Center, and they're looking to sequence a million of their patients um, in the next five years, which is incredible and very ambitious, but it's a, you know, a partnership between a university and a New York City company. Um, another one that was just announced was ARNI, or the AI Institute for Artificial and Natural Intelligence at Columbia University, who just got a $20 million grant from the NSF to be able to explore AI for neuroscience purposes. Um, and then also, Governor Hochul just uh, announced a $25 million grant to uh, the Cure Building for to build the lab of the future to try and automate some of this stuff. New York Stem Cell Foundation is another one that's doing it. Uh, the Center for Engineering and Precision Medicine, um, a partnership between Mount Sinai and RPI. These are some of the initiatives that are going on, and they're coming through at a rapid clip. And so, like these these initiatives, I think are really a great way to find the data necessary to build the, the AI models that you need to be able to confirm or at least, you know, get a much more valid hit. So it's an exciting time to be here in New York City for this stuff. Wonderful. Uh, well, we're approaching the end of our, our session over here, but I want to try to get in a, at least a couple more questions. Uh, I have one question here from the audience here. This is a bit broad, but I, I'd, like, I'd like the panel's opinion on this. Where do you see the largest need for AI solutions in life sciences or drug development? And why do you think AI is uniquely positioned to address that need? Uh, maybe server, we could start with you, server. I would say collecting the right type of data that actually have a, um, that represents the clinical information. Um, like I said, if you're sequencing an unrepresentative patient population, or if you're looking at the data in the wrong place, you can apply the AI as much as you want, you're not going to get the right. So finding the right type of data, collecting that at scale is important. And biology is complex. Biology is dynamic. A biomarker you see now might disappear in five minutes. So if you're looking at a single data point and you don't see the whole movie, you just see a, a picture frame, you won't, uh, you won't glean any biological information from that. And that's where AI can come into play uh, if you're collecting data at a temporal space uh, from different uh, assays from the lab, AI can actually put them all together and say which uh, biomarkers are the one that give you the most predictive predictive um, data point, and then you can you can focus on that. Um, um, I think the AI, AI has the ability to uh, reduce the complexity of biological questions, and it can do it at scale, um, but you always need to validate it uh, back in the lab. Great. Mike Barron, what's the largest need for AI solutions in, in drug development? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you uh, three real quick that I'm just most excited about. And I'll just walk down the framework I gave earlier, research, development, patient experience. So on the research side, uh, this uh, generative AI uh, in uh, small molecule and even antibody design uh, is, is it's very exciting, right? Like being able to just, uh, or even make synthetic proteins that have therapeutic application. So that's one. Two is uh, on the clinical side, 
I think there's very near term immediate impact to be harvested and applying AI algorithms for just running clinical trials. Like, you know, every biotech company and pharma company uh, has their patient recruitment curves that we pro project before the study starts. And then it's the game of uh, making sure that, you know, recruitment is going according to schedule, screen failure rate is right, and uh, adjusting as appropriate. I mean, that's such an easy one to fix. Like, you know, recruitment's down. They, the algorithm suggests, like, run some advertising in this specific geography. Uh, that's today. And then on the uh, patient experience side, I would just go fall back on the uh, example I gave earlier around wearables. Uh, specifically digital biomarkers and those becoming more uh, commonly incorporated into clinical trials. Wonderful. Priyanka, how about you? Here with a lot of the perspectives, I would just add cell and gene therapy to the list in particular. I think the regulatory environment for these two areas has really opened up. We've also generated a lot of data um, in these spaces with the recent human genome product project. And I just feel like there's a, a big opportunity to accelerate that space with adding AI into the mix. Wonderful. And Kyle? Um, so I think one of the, uh, so there are a lot of the issues I think were named already, but some other ones I think that are important to, to kind of address would be the digitization of health records to be able to generate the data. And then beyond that, um, putting up an ethical framework for data, like responsible data sharing, uh, which is going to be a challenge and something that's really necessary to be able to gain the public's trust that this is a good thing and that this will ultimately bring a net positive. Uh, so, you know, clinical health records and, and data sharing, but in a very ethical way. Got it. Okay. Well, for my last question here, uh, Kyle, I actually want to pose it to you, and I'm just going to bring up a hypothetical person in our audience, uh, an entrepreneur who was uh, about to start a company. Um, they have some loose ties to, let's let's call it RTP, um, not New Jersey. Let's say it's RTP, um, but they, they're in the audience over here, and they got a little intrigued by this conversation. Is like, hmm, New York City. Who do they reach out to? Who do they talk to about getting more interest about potentially locating, locating their company in New York City? How do they get started with NYC, EDC? Who do they call? What do they do? So we do have a contact us form on our website, and I think that we are a great start. Um, also, SBS, the Small Business Service, is another one. Um, these are some really wonderful resources. We actually we have a partnership team. Um, here at EDC, we're a fairly large organization at about 500 people. And so, of course, we have business development and partnership activities. Um, they don't usually deal with very small companies. It's like it's, it's a little bit larger, but um, we are certainly a great resource to at least point you in the right direction if we can't help directly. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank our panel. It was a really wonderful session today. I want to thank everyone in the audience for tuning in. There were some really great questions. I really enjoyed moderating this panel. And we really appreciate NYC EDC for sponsoring this discussion at Endpoints webinars. Again, if you'd like to rewatch this session or to share it with your colleagues, a link for on-demand viewing will be available tomorrow. I'm Arslan Araf for Endpoints News. Thanks for joining us, and we hope to see you at a future Endpoints event. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.